my aunt loves to remind me or tell me a story because I don't remember myself of when I was just two or three and we went out to a restaurant and she'd come with her family and this is a restaurant that gave bread in a basket on the table for everyone at the table to share and there was one piece of bread left and she was going to eat it and just at two or three I threw a fit because I wanted that last piece of bread and didn't let her have it and then I didn't even end up eating the bread after I'd thrown such a big uh, <laughs> fuss about it. So I want you to also think, and um, I've got a spot for you to write it down when you come up with something at the top of your handout. When you were a young child, was there ever anything that you thought you couldn't live without? Maybe it was a toy for Christmas or your birthday. Everyone was going to have one. If you didn't get one, you might as well just not show up at school because you know, that was going to be the end of your social life. It was something you could not live without. Or maybe it was a pair of shoes or a specific pair of jeans. If you didn't have that, it might as well just have been over. So think about that. You know, As a child, what is something you thought you couldn't live without? And once you've thought of that, you know, write that down in a the spot there at the top of your handout. Now once you've thought of that, I want you to think about where is it now? Do you even still have it? Is it lost? Has it been sold in a garage sale? Chances are, you know, it's probably at the bottom of your closet in the garage or isn't even important to you anymore, even though at one point you thought you couldn't live without it. Some of the Ephesians thought that their city could not survive without the temple of Artemis. It was the center of their industry. It brought lots of tourists to their city, and they just didn't understand how their city could survive without this large temple. But at some point, this temple was forgotten because it's just ruins today. What they thought was so important, archaeologists had to dig up. And I've got pictures there in your handout, right there, those questions where you've written down, you know, what you thought was important of lost. Um, we have a model of what it looked like at Paul's time, and then right beside that, what it actually looks like today, a photo of that area. You see that one column kind of there in the right, there's some stuff you see in the front. I'm not really sure what that is in the picture, because everything I read says that one column is all that still exists at this temple. Uh, this big, huge temple, and one column is all that's still there. And they thought it was so important that their city just couldn't survive without it. And, um, Ephesus is still there. Um, it's kind of moved locations, but I mean, the city is still surviving, even though it doesn't have this temple anymore. The temple had already been there for hundreds of years, when Paul had come to Ephesus, the temple was probably built somewhere between um, the 8th and the 6th century BC. So that means by the time Paul was here, that temple was already somewhere between 600 and 800 years old. It was an old <clears throat> temple. It was also the largest building in the Greco-Roman world. This temple was just gigantic. It was even four times larger than the Parthenon, which is another large building we think of when we think of that area of the world. It was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was a source of income for many of the people in the city. And all that remains of that temple today is a single column. It was completely forgotten. We didn't even know where it was until 1869, when an expedition sponsored by the British Museum sent archaeologists to that area, and they um, uncovered what we know of it today. Ephesus was a large, influential city that was teeming with life and activity. It had a population of 250,000 people. So that's a big city for today, you know, a fairly large city. You know, that was a gigantic city for then. And so we can understand why Paul wanted to go to this city. This was a strategic city for him to reach as many people with the gospel as he could. And living in Oklahoma, I you know, grew up in a small town in Oklahoma. I'm sure some of you are from small towns in Oklahoma. You know that if you need to go to the mall or go to the store, you have to go to the nearest big city, you know, whether that's Oklahoma City, Tulsa, even depending on where in Oklahoma you are. I'm sure it was the same then. Ephesus was a big city, but there were little towns all over. And if they needed something, if they needed to go and buy things that you couldn't find, or if they needed to even go and give their sacrifices at the temple, they came to Ephesus to do that. So not only did Paul have this big city to reach with the gospel, he probably had people coming in from all over to do business there in the city that he was able to reach, and then they were able to take the word back out. So he was reaching hundreds of thousands of people right there in Ephesus. <coughs> the temple of Artemis in Ephesus uh, would have contained 127 columns, 
and these cones were 60 feet tall. So it's kind of part of the scene, that picture there of the model, and I'm not sure if the model was um, the same size as what it would have been, but those columns stretched 60 feet high, and there were at least 127 of them. So this is a very big building. Also, Ephesus hosted a month-long festival celebrating Artemis each year. And at this festival, there would be um, carnivals, games, plays, concerts, banquets, parties going on for a whole month. People came from over the whole Roman Empire to Ephesus to be a part of this big celebration once a year. Uh, there will also be sacrifices and offerings going on at the temple during this um, festival. And I'm sure you know most people were attracted to the festivities, not just the sacrifices and Artemis. They may not even have known exactly you know, the point. You know, um, Like we lose the point to some of our holidays. They were just there to have fun, like Mardi Gras and um, Louisiana. And they were coming from all over. And just like um, you can go to tourist places today and buy, you know, say you go to um, Paris and you could buy a little model of the um, Eiffel Tower, that's basically what they were doing here. Um, the story of Demetrius the silversmith that we're going to be looking at today, what he was afraid of losing, the business he was afraid, is he was making little silver replicas of this huge temple. And he was selling them to tourists who were coming for this festival. And we actually are going to be looking at a verse in um, Acts and... Um, in verse 35, uh, yeah, I think I'm going a little too, okay, this is verse 24. Verse 24, he said, um, we receive a good income from this business. So he was making a lot of money from selling these little replicas of the temple that made out of silver. So just like, you know, tourists today, you know, want a little memento, they were buying these to take as souvenirs home with them. And that was his livelihood. The Greek goddess Artemis was the Roman goddess Diana. The Romans had different names for the Greek gods, but they had most of the same gods. For example, um, the Romans called Zeus Jupiter. And so Artemis was the Greek name for the god. Diana was the Roman name for the god. She was a mother goddess, a fertility goddess, and a nature goddess. And I've got a picture of an idol of her there. That is actually an idol from the first century. So this would have been when Paul would have been there, and that's actually a picture from one that they've got at a museum in Turkey. And you see that she's got some kind of um, bulbous shape or object on her chest. We aren't exactly sure what this was. So you, for the, a god that was so important then, I'm sure you could have asked anybody then what that was. We've totally even forgot what some of the things you know, that are part of her idol are today. Some of the things that um, scholars have um, suggested that these objects maybe are, and I swear I'm not making one of these up. You're going to think I am, but I got this list from the IVP commentary on the New Testament. Some of the things scholars have suggested is maybe she had multiple breasts, and these represent breasts. Maybe they're ostrich eggs. Maybe they're steer testicles. I told you, you're going to think I'm making some of these things up, but I read these, you know, I got this list from the IVP commentary of the New Testament. Maybe they're grapes. Maybe they're acorns. You know, she was a nature goddess, so um, nature was often part of the worship and um, her idols. So we aren't even sure what these are, you know, in this idol when we look at her today. Also, something else about the worship of her there in Ephesus, and this was the verse 35. It says, um, her image, which fell from heaven, and that's how um, the NIV translates it, depending on what version you have. That reads a little bit differently. For example, the ESV says, a sacred stone that fell from the sky. And the ESV even has a footnote there that says that the Greek meaning is uncertain. So we aren't exactly sure what the Greek words mean there. That's why we have some difference in the translation, whether it's an image from heaven, a sacred stone that fell from the sky. We know that a city in the Greco-Roman world called Taurus had a meteorite that had fallen from the sky, and they worshipped that in worship of Artemis, the same goddess, and as part of an image of her. From the extra-biblical, you know, the material outside of the Bible that we have on Ephesus, we don't have any information about a meteorite being in Ephesus. It doesn't mean that there wasn't. Um, so some scholars have suggested that maybe this was an idol that was so old that people didn't remember when it was made or where it came from of Artemis in this temple, because like I said, this temple was 600 to 800 years old by now, so there's possibly things in there that people don't even remember how old they were, and it was so old that some people had started saying that a person didn't make this idol. This idol was handed down from heaven, you know, so we would have an image of what Artemis actually looked like. And so that might have been what I was talking about. But 
They had some kind of stone or image that they said came from the sky or from heaven that they also worshipped as in part of their worship of Artemis. Artemis, she had the biggest temple. It was the biggest building in the Greco-Roman world. She wasn't the only god of Ephesus, though. Just like um, the Near Eastern world, the Greco-Roman world was polytheistic. They worshipped many gods. Um, the Greeks, when they would conquer people, rather than just imposing their gods on them, often they would take the gods of those people and just add it to their pantheon of gods. And there are temples, usually, of course, smaller temples, but there's temples of other gods in Ephesus. So they were a polytheistic people. And the story we're looking at um, today is in Acts 19. And the story we're actually looking at, you see, I've got the passage there at the top of your handout, is verses 23 to 41. But to just give you some context in that story, I want to start a few verses before that, and maybe we'll see what Demetrius was worried about. Here. <coughs> in verse 18 it says, Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas, which was 50,000 silver pieces. So, at this time, Paul had already been in Ephesus for two years. So he'd had time to witness to a lot of people, and Paul spends three years in total in Ephesus. And like I said, Ephesus was a teeming city of 250,000 people, so Paul kind of took a rest here, stayed for three years, and we can see why. Because he had a lot of people to reach, it was a strategic area. And during this time, already a lot of people had believed in Jesus, and they were coming forward and they were confessing the gods that they used to believe in, were giving those up, the things that they used to do. And also another big thing, in addition to the worship of Artemis in Ephesus, was the practice of magic. People practiced magic and sorcery. A big thing was books or scrolls that had spells on it that people could buy and for different things they would try to cast these spells. Well, these people that had become Christians, they believed in the one true God, they knew that these things were wrong now. And so they brought all these scrolls to Paul, and they put them in a big pile, and they burned all these scrolls that had these incantations, these spells, this magic that they would use to worship. And there were so many of them that they estimated that it was worth 50,000 pieces of silver, all of the scrolls and books that they burned. And to give you an idea of how much that was, today, that would have been about $6 million. So they brought $6 million worth of books there that they were like, you know, we don't do this anymore, we're going to burn it up. And back then, books were a lot more expensive today. You know, if you're thinking, you know, how many books $6 million would buy today, that's not exactly how many we would have bought back then. They didn't have a printing press, so a book had to be copied by hand, every word. So it was a lot of money to buy a book. But still, for there to be $6 million worth of these books, there were a lot of books. So it wasn't just a few people that had believed in Jesus and had turned away from what they were doing. There were a lot of people in Ephesus that were realizing what we used to do was wrong. We're going to follow Jesus now. And they burned those scrolls and those books that they had that had magic spells in it. So I'm sure Demetrius, who makes his living selling replicas of a temple of a pagan goddess, is thinking if even more people turn to this new god and they decide that they don't want things to remind them of their pagan gods, you know, I could be out of a job. And it's a job, you know, he said was making good income. And so then we actually start in the story that's told in verse, starting in verse 23. And it says, about that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way. The way is what they were calling Christians at that time. There wasn't really a name for this new religion yet. And so a name that they were going by and other people were calling them was the way. It sounds like a trendy name of like a mega church today. I can see them you know, having a sign saying the way. If I was to start a church, that's what I'd call the way. <laughs> that's what they were calling themselves at this time. There was a disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius who made silver shrines of Artemis, those were those little replicas of the temple that he was making and selling, brought in no little business for the skilled workers there. He called them together along with the workers in related trades and said, You know, my friend, that we receive a good income from this business. And when it says from the other trades, um, it probably wasn't just the silversmiths that were the be in trouble if um, the Christians had more people turn away from the pagan goddesses. A temple this large, you know, there was probably the people that made the marble idols, that provide marble for the columns, all kinds of jobs that were at risk. So he brings a lot of trades people that might be affected by this. And you see and hear this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. 
he says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. And uh, this is something that Paul teach, um, taught. We can see uh, just a few chapters earlier, actually, in chapter 17. This is Luke, um, who wrote Acts, recording a sermon that Paul was giving. And in Acts 17, 29, he says, Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think about the divine being as like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design or skill. So in um, Acts 17, Paul is teaching that um, something that's made of gold or silver or stone, that's just an image made by human hands. That's not God. And so Demetrius knew what Paul had been teaching, and we see that teaching here. And he said large numbers had been um, brought to believe this. And um, just in this same chapter, a few verses earlier in verse 10, it says... Uh, even starting in verse 9, and starting in the middle of verse 9. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. They went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. So he was making sure that everyone in the province of Asia, big area, this is just one big city, you know, had heard that message. He was making sure that that message got out. Um, the first thing he did when he got to Ephesus um, because he arrives in Ephesus at the first of chapter 19, is he goes to the synagogue, and he preaches there for three months. He did that in a lot of the cities. So he'd already been here um, for about two years at this time, and then we have this story happening. He's there for about another year. There is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited, and the goddess herself who has worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world will be robbed of her divine majesty. So he thinks the city can't survive without this great temple. But we know, um, just a few hundred years later, that temple was forgotten, and it was several, you know, almost 2,000 years later before that temple was discovered again. It was forgotten about. And maybe, you know, Paul turning people to Jesus had you know, something to do with that temple being forgotten. When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius, and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and all of them rushed together into the theater. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd. The disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. So Paul wanted to go into this theater that had this large crowd of people that were upset, but his friends told him, that's probably not a very good idea right now. These people are mad because of what you've been teaching. And it says, even the officials of the land. So um, these are the people that were actually the leaders, because Ephesus was an Asian city. Rome, of course, was not in Asia, but this was a land that they had conquered. And so Rome would send officials to be over, make sure that Ephesus was following Rome's rules, that they were sending taxes back. And these officials had even become friends with Paul and were realizing that what Paul was doing was not, you know, causing, you know, a stir. And these officials were also in charge of enforcing what was called the imperial cult. So in addition to all the gods that they had, Rome also had the imperial cult, was where they worshipped the emperor. Now, unlike um, when we talked about Darius, the king who thought he was a god and threw Daniel into the lion's den, they actually waited until their emperors were dead to call them emperors. How that works, you know, exactly as we talked about with Darius, the problem with calling yourself a god is that you eventually die. Well, they waited until their emperors were dead to call them gods. Um, it started with Augustus and then Julius Caesar when they died. The Senate passed a law telling Rome, you know, well, they're a god now, and everyone has to worship them as a god. And it was these officials' job to enforce that worship. And they even used words like Lord and Savior, and for Julius Caesar, even Son of God, to call their gods. And so when they heard Paul using these same words of Jesus, you know, Lord, Savior, Son of God, they maybe be thought that um, Jesus was going to be you know, a threat to their emperor. But at this time, the officials were friends with him. They saw that Paul wasn't trying to stir up, you know, any kind of overthrow of the government. He was just teaching about the God that he loved and cared about. And also, um, the theater that they ran into, this was also one of the features that when you came to Ephesus, you would have wanted to see. It was one of the main points of their city was a 25,000 seat theater. This is a large theater, so some of those plays and concerts they put on when that festival was going on were probably held at this theater. And if you were to travel to Ephesus today, that theater is still there. You can still visit it. I don't know if they still put shows on there. It's you know, kind of a relic now. 
And there's a picture there of what that theater looks like today. And this is the very theater that all these people were gathering in the riot against Paul. And the assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. So they got so riled up, you know, some of the people, you know, like uh, Demetrius, you know, they had a purpose, but some of the people were just there, the riot, and they didn't even know what was going on. And we've seen, you know, recent riots, you know, overseas, like in Greece and um, Europe with problems with the economy, and we see all the violence, you know, sometimes people just get caught up in, do they even know what they're doing? Do they even know the purpose of the riot? You know, these people didn't, you know, some of them didn't even know why they were there. They were still going to riot and, you know, cause a fuss. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander to the front, and they shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And um, the Jews actually had a very strong presence in Ephesus. Um, Ephesus was in Asia, so it was away from their Jewish homeland. But Jews, you know, at this time were spread all over the Roman Empire. They'd been in exile for so long. And there was a very strong Jewish presence in Ephesus. And they had been there for hundreds of years. They had a synagogue there. We already said, you know, if you look earlier in um, chapter 19, the first thing Paul did when he got to Ephesus, like he did in a lot of cities, is he went to the synagogue. And he preached about Jesus for three months before he even started talking to the other people in Ephesus about Jesus. Because he did care about the Jews, knowing that Jesus was the Savior that had come for them. But the Jews still weren't um, believing in Jesus as their Savior. And um, they wanted to make sure that these people knew that this new religion, the way, they weren't associated with it. You know, they were mad and um, rioting. They were like, we've been in this city for hundreds of years without a problem. We don't want them to all of a sudden think they have a problem with us, too, that we're somehow associated with this. So they sent one of the members of the congregation, Alexander, to try to calm the people down and say, the Jews don't have anything to do with this. Don't think that we're associated with this. The problem is here that the Jews should have had a problem with this because the Jews also believed that there was only one true God. And the people in Ephesus knew that. And the Jews didn't believe that there were many gods like Artemis and all these other gods. And maybe that was part of the problem that the people had been able to live in peace with the Jews for hundreds of years because they didn't want to rock the boat. They just wanted to stay back. You know, we'll have our religion. You have our religion. And we don't have to bother each other. But Paul wasn't going to let that stay. You know, he wanted everyone to come and believe in God. He wasn't going to sit back so he didn't rock the boat. But they were just wanting to you know, sit by and not rock the boat. You know, you believe your thing, we'll believe our thing. We don't have anything to do with Paul and this new religion the way. But they weren't going to have anything to do with it. They knew that the Jews believed in just one God also. And they began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Then the city clerk comes out. The city clerk quieted the crowd and said, People of Ephesus, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and her image, which fell from heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to calm down and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. If then Demetrius and his associates have grievance against anybody, the courts are open, and there are proconsuls. They can press charges. If there is anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of what happened today. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion, since there is no reason for it. After he said this, he dismissed the assembly, and everyone went home. And there was good reason for that, because when he said they were in danger, they really were in danger. We see today, you know, when there's a big riot, they might send police with, you know, rubber bullets, tear gas, you know, they don't want to really hurt the people. The Romans weren't too concerned with hurting people, and the Romans did not like riots. And um, Ephesus was Asia, so again, it wasn't you know, part of the Roman Empire proper. It was a part of the Roman Empire that the Romans had conquered and had made part of their empire. And if your um, city, you know, it was allowed to be pretty much independent as long as they paid taxes to Rome. But if your city was thought to be rioting, they would send a Roman legion down there. They would have swords and spears, and, and today, you know, we might say, you know, they would shoot first, ask questions later. You know. They would come in there, and they would make sure that riot stopped. So the city clerk, you know, reminded everyone, you know, if you guys are rioting, we're in danger. If Rome hears that there's a riot going on here, they will send soldiers down here, and they will stop the riot. So he said, make sure, you know, if you think Paul really is doing something wrong, take care of it in court. Do it peaceably, because they didn't want the danger of the Romans coming down and stopping the riot, which they would have done.
And um, later, Paul even recounts this story in 2 Corinthians um, 8. And so as we look here, you know, what does this showdown reveal to us about God? We have the benefit of Paul even looking back at this story and telling us what he learned from the story. And in 2 Corinthians 8, it says, in 1 8, and he was writing this when he was in Ephesus to the Corinthians. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province Asia. So when he was in Asia and Ephesus, they were having problems there. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope, and he will continue to deliver us. As you help us by your prayers, then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us and answer to the prayers of many. So he said, you know, we were having troubles in Asia, and one of the troubles he was probably talking about was this episode here in Acts. And the reason it happened was so that they would have more faith in God. And so when we have troubles, we can think that same thing. You know, this is happening, so we'll have more faith in God. When, you know, you only have a few kids show up for a club, you know, you feel like club's not going well. It might be there, you know, so that you'll have to trust God for that club. Yeah. Or you have, you know, some troubles, you know, with the club and, you know, the kids. You know, maybe God's putting those troubles there, so you'll have to rely on Him more. Yeah. And um, there on your handout, you know, uh, we also have, you know, Christianity was not just a new way. They were calling Christianity the way. It was the way. And that was Demetrius's problem with it, you know, the... Romans had no problems with adding more gods. You know, they would have been happy to add another god to their list of gods. But that wasn't what Paul was teaching. He was teaching that Jesus was the only way to salvation. And that was the problem they had with it. And then finally, um, your faith should disrupt your life. And if you're able to continue living exactly as you did before you were a Christian, then something's not quite right there. Our faith should, you know, disrupt, and that's what Demetrius is afraid of. He was afraid that Christianity coming to Ephesus would disrupt how things had always been. He wanted the things that just continue the way things had already been, like the Jews that had been there. You know, don't rock the boat. And a lot of people, you know, today they think, you know, faith is fine as long as you keep your faith private. You know, you believe what you want to believe. I'll believe what you know I believe. Let's nobody rock the boat. You know, things can just keep going. But, you know, if our faith is private, then something's, you know, not right. Our faith should disrupt our life. It should change the way we live our lives. And, you know, ever since, you know, these times, you know, so for thousands of years, you know, we've always debated, you know, how should Christians live with the world, live with culture? And some of the responses to this, you know, is we can withdraw from culture. And that's what some Christian groups have done, like the Amish, you know, well, if we, you know, don't want to do the things that the world does, we'll just withdraw from the world. But we see that that's not what Paul did. Paul was out there, you know, he wanted these people to believe in Jesus. Um, we can assimilate into culture. We see people doing that today, you know, we see people, you know, yeah, um, we'll teach evolution and, you know, we'll find out how to fit that with the Bible, you know, and they just assimilate with culture. They accept the things that culture does. We didn't see Paul do that either, you know, he wasn't afraid to rock the boat. And so we, there's another option also, you know, we can transform culture. If people see how different we are, then that can make a change in the culture around us. And there's no doubt that Paul did make a change in the culture. That temple was forgotten, and I'm sure that he had something to do about that. And we talked about, you know, the culture were part of Western culture. It did develop out of and from Greco-Roman culture. And most of the differences, though, and there are a lot of differences from Greco-Roman culture and the culture we have today, is because the Western culture that we have is also influenced strongly by Christianity. Christianity did have a mark on the culture that we have today. I mean, secularists today might try to deny that, you know, it all came from these, you know, myths and stories, you know, that you could read before Christianity came along. But Christianity has put its stamp on our culture, and it's undeniable. And so we should be here, you know, to continue that work, to be transforming culture. 